Evolutionists teach that we all evolved from a common ancestor. But one of the things they don't like to talk a lot about is design. Design in living organisms. And we're going to talk about that specific design today. And I want to welcome you to Creation Training Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the founder and president of Creation Training Initiative. Today we have a guest with us, Dr. Joe Martin, all the way from Texas. All the way from Texas. Well, Good thank you here, for Mike. coming. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question for you. Were you always a creationist? Uh, no, no. As a matter of fact, uh, I was raised in the church, a little Baptist church, but um, I was not a Christian. I didn't know anything really about the Bible, but I went to college and took a course in organic evolution and became an evolutionist right away. So it was the um, universities that converted you? It was the university, yes, Bucknell University. And, and you know that's happening to a lot of our youth today? Well, I think it's happening to the, the majority of them yes. when you come right down to it. Well, go ahead. What, what, what's, what changed you then? Well, uh, I went to dental school, uh, University of Pittsburgh, became a dentist. When I got out of dental school, I was an agnostic. I wasn't an atheist. An atheist just says there is no God. Agnostic says, I don't know. I said, you know, if somebody asks you, what's an agnostic? Just say, I don't know. That's the right <laughs> okay. answer. And uh, so I was agnostic, looking into Zen Buddhism, evolutionist. This is the 60s. I was in Vietnam War days. I was the hippie generation. There were other people back there, too, I think. Okay. And um, so anyway, so I got out of the Air Force and uh, got, became, ultimately became a professor of dentistry. And I gave my first lecture on the evolution of the tooth. And I talked about how fish scales over thousands of years moved into the mouth and became teeth. I mean, I can't believe I believed that, but that's what I believed. That's what I was taught. They're still teaching it. By the way, there's no relationship at all between scales and teeth, scales and feathers, scales and hair, scales and porcupine quills. Doesn't matter how you look at it, histologically, embryologically, physiologically, functionally, anatomically. Well, there only is if you hire artists to draw that. <laughs> that is exactly right. And that's what we're seeing in our textbooks. That's exactly right. A lot of artists, uh, a lot of just art. Yeah. So you're, you're an evolutionist now, and you're teaching in, in uh, the university. What university was that? It was Baylor College of Dentistry. Baylor College of Dentistry, and you're a professor now, just going along your happy way, teaching evolution. I'm teaching it, and two of my students after that lecture challenged me. Now, they did it politely. They came up after class. Dr. Martin, would I be willing to study creation science with them? 1971. So I, uh, I'm thinking as this cocky rookie, this is my first lecture, okay? I'm a cocky rookie professor. And I got challenged by two of my students. I mean, whoa, these guys, I got to set them straight. So would I study with them? I said, sure, I'll study with you. I'm thinking I'm going to have to straighten them out. But the, the scientists have proven billions of years. What's the matter with you guys? Well, it took almost five years. But I emerged a biblical creationist. What, what specifically changed you? Well, it was three things. I'm studying my Bible. I'm studying the assumptions behind evolution, which I was never, never taught, didn't know how to look at them. Uh, things that you read the scientific articles and it'll say things like we think this, perhaps this, maybe this, we posit this, we believe this, there's consensus about this, uh, this could be. Those are the assumptions. And, there, and the scientific articles are full of those kind of words, but nobody ever taught me that those words really mean we don't have a clue about this. In other words, the evolutionists don't want their people to know this. In other words, who's, and when it comes down to it, they don't want people to know the real science, do they? Oh, that's exactly right, because their science is based on a, a fantasy, because they don't want to believe in God. So you, you actually employed something that we don't do much in schools today, critical thinking skills. Which I didn't learn in school. Two, yes. two students taught me. Look at these words. Exactly. So, so go, go ahead now. What, well, what I stu next? we're studying the, these assumptions, and I began to realize the assumptions aren't valid. I'm reading my Bible, and then they asked me to look at uh, some animals. And the first one they brought me was the bombardier beetle, a little insect that mixes chemicals that have a violent explosive reaction. It shoots its enemies. And there's no way it could evolve because every time it got these chemicals that they mix up, it's going to blow itself up unless it had like an asbestos line firing chamber, which it does. And even then it would blow itself up if it didn't have somewhere for the explosion to go. And it does, twin tail tubes. You aim out the side, out the back, any which direction. So it needed all its parts. It needed the right nervous system. It needed to know who to shoot and who not to shoot. Uh, it needed to know how to aim, and it can aim within a tenth of a millimeter. I mean, it can aim pinpoint, right exactly where. And I began to, and other animals, giraffe and woodpeckers and things, and I began to realize these animals need all their parts. 
you can't have a partially evolved anything. It either is fully functional or it doesn't work. And so you can't have something evolving along here to get to there because there's no way it's going to work till it gets there. Now, can I play the role of the evolutionist here real quick? And his, here's the, the common responses. Well, over millions of years, many mutations. Do you know over millions of years, many mutations is a faith statement? It is not a scientific statement. And well, that's the only comeback they, they can do. So that's that's it's fuzzy their, words. Yeah, yeah, that's their rescuing device yes. every time. Millions of years. Yep, millions of years. Just It'll happen, just give it enough time. Yes. But the fact is, it can't happen. No. Because how are you going to get hydrogen peroxide, hydroquinone, to get a gland inside a bug that makes both of those different things and then make the right catalyst so that it squirts that in and gets your... There's, there's absolutely no way. And where do those things come from? So this, this creature basically shoots out almost like a liquid fire. It does, yeah. So here's our... And how long is this beetle? It's not long, half inch, half inch, maybe three quarters. So inch. right there, we have great testimony of a dragon-like creature, don't we? Well, half inch long. It's not like the dragons we have in our folklore and everything, or yeah. really happen, but that gives testimony to a creature in the Bible called Leviathan. Shoots out smoke and fire. I think so. In the animal kingdom, that's Go, possible. Because it is scientifically possible to deny it as being unscientific. Now, I isn't agree. It? I agree. What a great example. So this creature started to get you along the line of there really is design and purposeful design. Oh, yes. Uh, it took almost five years because that's the biggest spiritual struggle I ever had, to go from Big Bang, billions of years, evolution, to being, here I am now, a biblical creationist. And by biblical creationist, I mean about a 6,000-year universe with a global flood covered the whole works maybe 44, 4,500 years ago. Now, how did you get from this old age to... Uh Six, about 6,000 years, six literal day creation. What, what specifically did that for you? Well, uh, those students pointed out the genealogical tables in the Bible and the fact that they're so specific. And it's like uh, God gave us those tables, the generations of people, to prove that Jesus is of the race of Adam and secondly, to prove when he made Adam and when he got it all started. So it has a, a, a double function. It may have more, but at least those mm -hmm. two. And so when you count back, uh, you know, it says Adam was so many years old and he gave birth to this one, and that one was so many years old and he gave birth to that one. And you can count them all up, and about all you can get is about 6,000 years. Now, for those people who have never heard about the bombardier beetle, do you have any material they could look at, like a DVD or anything they could get to take a look at this amazing creature? Well, we do have that on our uh, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. I think it's in number one. It's, as a matter of fact, it is because it's the first, the first one I did. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get that out there because most people never heard of a bombardier beetle. Now, if they wanted to get a hold of that DVD, how could they do it? Oh, uh, they can go to biblicaldiscipleship.org. Biblicaldiscipleship.org, and that's yes. your website. And that's they our can get main that website. DVD up there and see this incredible creature that shoots out liquid fire. Exactly right. And we have a lot of others, too. Uh, we have creatures that people never heard of, like nudibranchs Neut or I, eye eyes. I don't even know how to spell nudibranchs. <laughs> nudibranchs, yes. It's a, it's a sea snail, okay. but it doesn't have a shell, so it doesn't have any defense. No, it's like a slug. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, except it's much more beautiful. Okay. They're some of the most beautiful animals on earth. I mean, they have stripes and, and polka dots and frills. and. So we have designer slugs now. <laughs> exactly, and they're very, very specifically designed. Uh, and But the thing of it is, most people never heard of those because the textbook industry is still controlled by the evolutionists. And if they can't describe something using evolutionary terms, they just leave it out. We're in Satan's world system based on deception. It's based on fraud. It's based on lies when you come right down to mm -hmm. it. So most people never heard of a nudibranch. Well, why? Well, because it steals its defense mechanism. Uh, it eats things, you know, jellyfish have those stinging cells, they're called nematocysts, and they really shoot, it's like a little harpoon. Well, it eats uh, creatures like anemones that have those stinging cells, but when it eats it, it doesn't set off the stinging cell. I mean, if you or I just touched that thing, bang, it would get us. So it gets it and eats it, doesn't set off the stinging cells, eats what it wants, digests what it wants, and now it's got this little bunch of these stinging cells it somehow potentiates them, make them have a stronger pop, and then puts them in little tubes and things up into its skin, up into its gills, 
and, and the defense mechanism of what it ate, like the anemone, becomes the defense mechanism of the nudibranch. It steals its defense mechanism. So really it doesn't get any new information, it just kind of steals the information from somebody else. Exactly right. What an amazing creature that is. Well, yeah, it had to be made to do that, because otherwise all it would do is touch the anemone I and mean, it'd shoot it. Oh, but wait a minute, Joe. Over millions of years in many mutations. <laughs> That's well, the only comeback the evolutionists seem to have. Well, you're right. We go on these college campuses, and that is what, that they're locked in. Yes. They're locked in. Give us enough time, yes. and it'll happen. Yes. But it can't happen, because you can't have a partially evolved anything. It either has to have all of its, well, okay, so we're at one university, and this guy says, well, yeah, I got my appendix out, I don't need my appendix, and, and I got my tonsils out, and I don't need that, and this, and well, uh, wh what about that? Well, the appendix, it's not a vestigial, it's not left over from some ancient past ancestor, it's functional. In other words, when you're a baby, it's a big part of your immune system. Same thing with your tonsils, okay, so they're not some leftover thing. There's still uh, biology teachers out there teaching it's a well, leftover that, organ. Oh, that is exactly right. How can they get a degree and teach that? Well, in Satan's world <laughs> system, yes. everything's based on deception. Yes. Now, a lot of them don't know it, and they're not intentionally deceiving. I think a lot of them, they, they just, well, like I was half my life. Yes. I thought that's just what was true. I never looked into it. I just took their word for it, and that was it. Okay. Yeah. How about um, some other creatures? Um, well, I'll tell you what. There's one that, um, that we just heard about. And since it was right now at Resurrection Sunday type I like that part of the year, um, and it's called the Crimson Worm. Oh, we're going from slugs to worms now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I try to stay away from worms and insects and things, but it's just it's happening right now. Yeah. So this worm, well, in Psalm uh, 22, that's one of the Messianic Psalms when Jesus is uh, uh, at the cross, and that's the one that tells us what he was saying while he was on the cross, like, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which he said. And then there must be words here that he was communicating uh, in his mind, because it's telling us this is what Jesus was doing here while he's on the cross. And he says in verse 6, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Well, that's a special word for worm. And it's called the crimson worm. And the, the Hebrew name for that worm is Tolaoth. Well, so Jesus says he is a Tolaoth, a crimson worm. Well, what's the big deal about that worm? That worm, the mama worm, uh, when she's ready to lay her eggs, she'll crawl up on a tree and attach herself to the tree so that you can't, uh, she can never unattach. She's just attached to the tree. She's going to die there on the tree. Uh, sometimes it'll be a fence post, but she likes a particular oak tree. This is a Middle Eastern worm. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I found there's also a species in Mexico. But anyway, so she crawls up. Now, Jesus is apparently familiar with this worm, because that's what he calls himself there, this Tolaoth. She crawls up, attaches herself to the tree, lays her eggs under, under herself, and she makes a shell, a red shell. It's about the size of a, of a small marble, and it's bright red. And then she lays her eggs, and then uh, uh, the eggs all hatch. And in about a three-day period, they uh, devour the mother. But she oozes a red dye that covers these baby worms and stains the tree. It's, it's royal red dye. It's what was used in the priest's garments. Mm -hmm. It's probably what was used in the... In the uh, ram's skin covering on the old tabernacle because it was dyed red and that's where they get uh, that color. So anyway, so she dies, she covers her uh, babies with red. So she dies so that she can birth a family. Jesus says, I am the Tolaoth worm. So he was attached to the tree like she is attached to the tree. His blood covers us and washes away our sin. Her blood covered her new generation, her, her family. His blood covers us. Well, then it says over in Isaiah, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, uh, Jesus is talking. Uh, the whole Bible is His Word, of course, yes. mm -hmm. Old and New Testament. And He says this, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, that's the word, tolaoth, wow. they shall be as wool. Hmm. Well, okay, so Jesus has in the back of his mind this tolaoth worm. It says that our sin can be washed away as white as snow, uh, as wool. Well, on day four, now she's, she's, her, she's had three days here where she's oozing this red material. On day four, she's dead, but her body contracts, and the abdomen uh, uh, comes up to the head, and it forms a heart-like shape, and then in a matter of minutes, it turns bright white. It looks like wool when you just look at it, and then it flakes off like snow. Amazing. Yeah. What did Jesus say? He said, uh, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Well, that's exactly what happens to that worm. Well, then you think, okay, uh, is there anything else about this thing? Uh, by the way, the, uh, the people over there will scrape those red shells off the trees, and that's how they make the dye. Then they'll take the white if, if they don't get it in time, it turns white. They take that and they make a certain type of shellac that is um, a pre preservative for wood. And also, they use that to make a medicine that helps heart arrhythmias. Okay? So it has a lot to do with the heart and with blood and those kinds of things. Well, then, Isaiah 66, and they shall go forth. And look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. So these are people that transgress against God. For their worm shall not die. That, this is the same word again now, tolaoth. For their worm, the tolaoth worm, the crimson worm, shall not die. Neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Well, okay. So in the book of Mark, then, over in Mark uh, chapter 9... Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark chapter 9, and Jesus again speaking, down in verse 43, and he says this, in Mark 9, 43, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. He's quoting Isaiah 66, 24, uh, which is the one that talks about the worm. And he says, if the worm doesn't die, you've got a problem. So now he's saying, okay, if your foot offends thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that is never quenched, where the worm dieth not. There it is again, tolaoth. Dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. He says the same thing about the eye. Better to pluck it out. Uh, better to have one eye and go to heaven than two eyes go to hell, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus is very much aware of that little Middle Eastern worm. How many people know about this worm? I've never heard about it. I either. never had either until just a few weeks ago, and I started researching it. The uh, scientific name... Is coccus, C O C C U S, illicis, I L I C I S, okay. illicis, okay? So coccus illicis, and you can Google that, and it'll all kinds of information comes up. So, how about some other animals? Uh, what are the other ones that you love to do? I've seen some of your lectures, and people just get into this. They've never seen this kind of design because they don't teach it in school. They don't. You say, well, what do we teach in school? Over millions of years and many mutations. <laughs> You're thinking, you see, we don't teach, like, look what our Lord has done here. You know, like chemistry. You got this benzene ring. If you hook something on over here, this isn't going to hook on over here. But if you move it to here, it'll hook on over here. And you're thinking, why don't, why don't we teach? That? Look what our Lord has done. I mean, the Creator who created all this, the Bible tells us that's Jesus. Where does it tell us that? Do you remember? John 1. Colossians 1, yes. Hebrews 1. That's right. Jesus is the creator. So 
he created these things so that if we study them, we give him glory. That's right. Now, also, uh, some of these amazing creatures you talk about, they're all on videos, but people say, and evolutionists say, not, not creationists, hopefully, that we evolved from ape-like creatures. Are there any examples that show that didn't happen? Well, actually, if you study any of the primates, they're all so different from each other, it's unbelievable. Like, well, for instance, just their muscles. I mean, our muscles are long, striated-type muscles, whereas the, the primates are more like a mesh. And that's why they're so much stronger than we are. When they contract that mesh, it just makes their, their muscles are just so much stronger, uh, the way the cells work with each other. But, um, well, just to mention three, uh, the baboon. Okay, the baboon has uh, pouches, like hamsters. And they'll go somewhere, and they'll eat, they'll fill up the pouches, and then they'll go where they feel safe to eat. They, they have a defense against um, lions. Say the lions are coming up here. Here comes a pride of lions. And here's your troop of baboons. Let's say there's 20 of them. They travel in numbers. So here come the lions. Well, the baboons aren't going to turn and run. They're just going to say, uh-oh, here comes the lions. They want to eat us. What are we going to do? So they line up. They make a line in front of the lions, and they all start turning flips. So here's this whole line of baboons just turning flips, turning flips, and the lions must look at that and think, yeah, it's got to be an easier way to get lunch. And they just turn and walk away. So I should try that next time I'm facing a lion. <laughs> yes, I think you should. <laughs> I don't think it'll work. Well, you're, or you could try uh, what they tell us to do, like if you face a mountain lion. Uh, if, if you're up there in Colorado somewhere, now in Texas they're in, uh, and here comes this mountain lion. Now, I think before the flood, during the flood, you could have had a pet mountain lion. But I don't think the enmity between man and beast came until Genesis chapter 9, where God says, now I'm going to put dread between you and the beast to Noah. Here comes the mountain lion. What they say to do is make yourself as big as you can. I mean, stretch those arms out and make yourself huge, and don't turn around and run. Just look right at it, and then you start backing up. If it keeps coming, you start yelling, hey, you bad lion, get back there. Now, I don't know who tested this. Okay. okay. So, I mean, I don't you know. You may not have them around anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Maybe someone observed somebody. Okay. But that's what they say. But anyway, what were we talking about? We're talking about the, oh, yeah, the baboon. Uh, how about a gibbon? A gibbon has a shoulder joint that goes 370 degrees. Now, why is that? I mean, there's no other primates like that. Where, where does that come from? Well, that's his main defense against pythons. He's, he climbs up a tree, and here comes a, uh, he's, this is called brachiation. They're swinging down the vines, okay? And uh, he looks ahead, and uh oh, there's a python. So he's going to turn around to go back the way he came. He doesn't have to let go. He just holds on. He's going to turn around. Well, the python knows he can do that. So the python has configured itself so I can get around here. And he, uh oh, and he just keeps going right on around, keeps going the direction he's going, never has to let go. So it's a defense mechanism. Why don't other primates have that? Uh, it's a whole mechanism, a whole special mechanism. In other words, don't try that at home. <laughs> no, 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 don't try it at home. You'll tear that shoulder up. Uh, that would assume, of course, that we're in the primate family, which we are not. We were created above the primate family to take dominion over the primate right. family as God's people. Well, then you also have um, the eye eye, and that's in uh, Madagascar. How do you spell that? A-Y-E dash A-Y-E. So, uh, the eye eye has all these characteristics different than other primates. Uh, it has big ears. It has a middle finger that looks like a piece of wire coming out of its hand. It, you, you, you look at, it looks normal, okay, but then this finger is like a long, skinny piece of wire with a hook on the end. Um, its teeth continue to grow like a beaver. It's the only primate like that. Where, where does that come from? If it, millions of years to do that, how, you know? Uh, now, why? Well, because it's going to eat grubs, because there's no um, woodpeckers in Madagascar. So God made a primate to do what the woodpeckers do. And what it does is it climbs up on the tree, it takes that finger with the, with the hook on the end, taps on the tree with its great big ears, it's listening, it can hear the grubs crawling around down in the tree. So as soon as it hears a grub, it starts chewing down into the tree. That's why it needs teeth like a beaver because it's going to wear them down. And if it didn't have teeth that kept growing as long as it lived, it would have to see me the next day to get false teeth. So he chews down in there. He finds the grub tunnel. He takes that long skinny finger and sticks it down in the grub tunnel, stabs the grub, brings it out, and eats it. 
you know, how would it even know? You know what? I can chew into a tree and, and stick my finger down in there and bring out lunch. I mean, there's information that is put into everything God has made that is necessary for its existence. I'm glad you brought that up because it's not instinct. I'm not sure what instinct is. It's information, as you said. God pre-programmed that into our DNA. It did not evolve. It was in there from the very beginning. That's the way God designed us. Well, it had to be because information is non-material. I mean, you can't take a piece of information and pull it out of a gene. You can't grab a piece of information out of the air and stick it into a gene. Any information that's already in the genes had to already have been put into those genes supernaturally. That's one of the questions I love to ask evolutionists. Can you show me any observational evidence where that vast amount of information came from that's in our DNA without requiring me to use faith? They can't do it. No, they can't do that. Well, this has been amazing, Joe. We'd love to have you back sometime, and uh, even your whole family, because I understand your whole family's in ministry, aren't they? We are, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you go around speaking all over the country and around the world, don't you? We do, yes. How, if somebody wanted you to come and speak, how would they get a hold of you? Biblicaldiscipleship.org is our Biblical main website. Biblicaldiscipleship.org, and you can get all these DVDs that they have out there. Okay. So if they want to have you come speak and talk about these incredible creatures, I think Christian school teachers should have this information because oh, it yes. makes students come alive, doesn't it, when they oh, see this yes. incredible design. Yes. It would be great if you could go out there and train many of these teachers how to teach this and replicate this all over the incredible design that God has given every living creature. He has, and that's why I'm counting on you to get all that done. <laughs> okay, Joe. <laughs> we'll go to work on it because I, right. I love your videos, and uh, they're, they're just amazing. And, Joe, I hope we can come get you back here sometime. And I want to thank all of you. Uh, Dr. Job Martin, incredible creatures that defy evolution. And I want to thank you again, and God bless all of you. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's Word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear.